Hello, good evening. Uh, this is Marcello Cordovani from Vito Italy, and uh, I welcome you once again to our um, appointment of uh, Friday with uh, Italy history, uh, with Roman history at the moment. It's uh, uh, 9.32 p.m. Sorry for the delay, but uh, some fine tuning for the link, the live feed. And um, well, it's uh, May 14th, episode 10 already. Well, uh, this means uh, 20 weeks almost, uh, I would say, oh, what, uh, five months? And uh, well, it looks like yesterday. <laughs> anyway. I'm very glad to see that some of you are online again and uh, I thank you very much once again for following us and uh, for uh, giving also your feedbacks. I received uh, a lot of feedbacks uh, uh, about the last episodes uh, and uh, I thank you very much. This is uh, a way to let me improve my presentations and get more and more interesting as I hope I, 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 I am. So, and um, so welcome uh, wherever you are. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And uh, tonight we are talking about uh, Emperor Vespasian and uh, also his uh, major uh, work, the work for which uh, he has become so famous throughout the centuries. And uh, I'm talking about the Colosseum. And uh, so, um, some of you may know that uh, this uh, I started this uh, this uh, talk uh, with the intention to go to uh, the 20th century, and uh, well, for the time being, I'm preparing more episodes, and uh, I'm quite confident I will be able to do that. Uh, this will span probably uh, through 2021 and 2022. But um, okay, let's go step by step and uh, let's talk about uh, Emperor Vespasian. But uh, if you uh, followed us um, uh, in the last episodes, you know that uh, first of all, we are talking about something, uh, what's going on here in, uh, in Italy. And uh, so we, we obviously with the pandemic, which is affecting all of us. Um, the situation now is uh, is quite, quite good, I would say uh, we are. Uh, in uh, opening up and slowly slowly uh, we are opening up um, probably uh, by mid-june uh, all activities will be open uh, 24 7 uh, there's a lot of uh, debate about uh, when to open until now we are um, for instance uh, shops are open but uh, shops in commercial centers are closed on on weekdays on weekends and uh, restaurants and bars uh, you can uh, eat only uh, on the outside and uh, they have to stop their service at uh, uh, 10 p.m. Well actually you have to be at home at 10 p.m. but uh, this limit is going to be lifted uh, in, uh, in a few days probably and uh, so we look forward to um, summer uh, it will still probably be uh, a summer with uh, European tourists and uh, um, we are aware that Americans uh, have been cleared for uh, coming here uh, if they are vaccinated and obviously we welcome them. But uh, as I told you in one of the last episodes, uh, our Victor is uh, resuming its full activity with the tours starting uh, only September the 1st. This means that you can book, you can make inquiries uh, right now and we will be glad to uh, build uh, to, to build itineraries as we did before. Uh, but uh, we will uh, uh, start new tours. Uh, we will uh, organize tours, uh, uh, only tours that start in September 1st. This is uh, mainly due to the fact that uh, we are quite cautious about uh, uh, the, the evolution of a pandemic and we need to see more results and uh, also we need to be vaccinated uh, most of our most operators need to be vaccinated so that uh, you, when you come here you come at uh, no risk at all that's that's our point actually uh, obviously some somebody else will tell you something else but uh, that's how we are going to behave when we are convinced and we are very firm in this policy 
and I hope you understand it. And uh, so these ladies uh, mean that uh, they will still have masks, but uh, the vaccination program is going quite well. Uh, you remember we had quarrels with AstraZeneca, and, but uh, fortunately another producer, Pfizer, is, um, came to our, to, to, aid, to our aid and uh, is producing uh, many more uh, doses. So the vaccination program is still going on quite fast. We have uh, uh, almost 500,000 uh, shots every day. And uh, um, the, the latest forecast is for the 70% of the population to be vaccinated uh, uh, within the end of July, beginning of, uh, of August. Uh, so uh, maybe, <clears throat> sorry, maybe uh, this summer we will uh, be able to, to spend some time without masks, uh, even if I think that masks will stay with us for for a very long time, at least in some some places. So, <clears throat> as you can see, we can uh, uh, we we can dine outside on the outside at uh, at lunch and uh, uh, at uh, dinner, but uh, only in uh, in um, uh, until uh, 10 p.m. right now. Uh, in a few days, uh, probably this uh, this. Uh, Time limit will be extended to um, 11 p.m. And uh, the Prime Minister said that it's time to reopen and uh, there's a strong push to have, uh, it, have it extended at least at uh, uh, 12 p.m. But uh, in the long run, uh, in a few weeks, probably it will be uh, lifted at all. So we'll be uh, again free to, to, to stay out also beyond uh, 12 p.m. Okay, uh, a few words about our activities. Um, <clears throat> as I told you, we are open for tours starting September the 1st in, in full safety. And uh, uh, probably you remember that last time we talked about uh, uh, two tours that, uh, two guided tours that we have decided to organize in uh, uh, September and October, uh, where I will be uh, the tour leader. And uh, these are small groups, uh, four to 10 uh, travelers. And uh, we have two tours. We have uh, a guided tour uh, going in, in, in to Southern Italy. Uh, that's the uh, authentic Italy guided Grand Tour South, goes to Naples then Amalfi, Matera, and Puglia, and back to Rome in 12 days. And uh, tonight I want to present you, and this is a, 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 shot, a screenshot of our uh, website and our um, landing page. So you see that uh, you, if you want to look for guided tours, you will see that uh, uh, you, you just uh, click guided tours and then you choose uh, among uh, uh, these uh, six tours, but uh, four of them have been postponed postponed <clears throat> well uh, they will they will take place in 2022 uh we will have two day two uh tours uh, uh one starting september uh, 14th uh, and it's the guided tour in southern italy and uh, the second is the italy in 10 days guided tour milan cinque terre florence and rome so you, you click on uh, on uh, milan on italy in 10 days guided tour and uh, you see this page. Uh, we have uh, this, uh, uh, the, the tour is starting October 14th for 10 days until uh, October 23rd. It starts in Milan and in, ends in uh, Rome. And uh, the highlights, the highlights are, uh, this is the map, uh, Milan, pa uh, Parma, then uh, um, Cinque Terre, Pisa, Florence, and all the way down, so down to, to Rome. Uh, left, uh, uh, northern left, uh, uh, left up quadrant. Then uh, uh, we have uh, Pisa. Uh, then we have uh, Borgo Bagno Vignoni. Bagno Vignoni is uh, uh, a place uh, in uh, in Val d'Orcia. 
Then we have, uh, still on the left, uh, we have uh, Santa Maria del Fiore, the Giotto's Bell uh, Tower in, in Florence. This is the, uh, the outskirts, the, the, the landscape of Florence. In the middle, we have the Cinque Terre. This is Vernazza. Then we have another place which is very, very peculiar, and it's the dying city, Civita di Bagnoregio. I visited it myself uh, last summer, and I was really stunned about about the place so you're gonna love it um on uh, on the bottom line we have on the left monte rigioni a sinise fortress on the borders between uh, uh, florence and siena and uh, then we have the roman fora uh, in rome and uh, um, the last is uh, san gimignano the towers of san gimignano and um well uh, what what else can i say uh, th these are some of the most fascinating, beautiful uh, places you can visit in Italy. Uh, October is not going to be crowded, was not so crowded uh, before the pandemic, and it's definitely not to be crowded uh, in, uh, in, 2020, in 2021. So I look forward to uh, meeting you and uh, spending 10 fabulous days, wonderful days, uh, uh, wandering uh, uh, around uh, northern Italy and finally to Rome and seeing beautiful things, uh, eating wonderful uh, uh, food and drinking uh, gorgeous wine. Okay, so, well, um, it's, uh, <laughs> that's all for, for the advertisement for, for tonight. And uh, we, need, we go now to our uh, history, to, to the history of, of Italy. And... Uh, and so, um, by the way, somebody asked also for history tours, and uh, I invite you to, to, to uh, make inquiries about the places you want to, to visit. Some of them, maybe we, we have, you have seen them in the, in the former, in uh, the last presentations. Uh, some of them you want to see them because uh, you heard about the Middle Ages. So uh, be sure, uh, obviously, we are organizing history, history tours uh, and we look forward to taking you to uh, extraordinary places with uh, uh, archaeologists and, uh, uh, and, and guides uh, and, uh, uh, which have uh, a degree in fine arts. So we are uh, now uh, beginning to the, the tale about the Emperor uh, Vespasian. And if you remember, uh, we were it uh, uh, in in the year 68 uh, uh, AD, uh, and uh, uh, our last tale was about the Emperor Nero and uh, um, how he died in uh, um, in the, in disdain, uh, how he was uh, proclaimed a public enemy by the uh, the Senate, and he was chased, and uh, he decided to um, to suicide. Okay, so Nero had died and uh, the Galba had been proclaimed uh, emperor. Uh, and uh, with the proclamation of Galba, it was clear that uh, the imperial regime uh, was not only linked to the prestige of uh, Augustus but, uh, and his family, but uh, it had become the form of the official form of government of Rome. And uh, uh, in addition to that, uh, the proclamation of Galba, you remember, by his legions of Spain, he, Galba was the governor of, uh, of Spain, is also very important uh, from, the, from an historical point of view, because uh, uh, someone can finally become emperor in Rome, but also away from them, from, from it. And... Uh, it, it, it is obviously thanks to the support of the legions of, uh, of the provinces. And uh, we now have a new subject, a new character, uh, which comes uh, on the stage. And uh, it's the army, the, the, the role of the army. You remember, surely you remember that the Praetorians, Praetorians are soldiers, so that's the army, that's a, 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 an elite core uh, of, uh, of the Roman army. And of course, Praetorians in the past have been decisive in getting the, the emperor 
uh, the, the favor that they favored in getting uh, uh, elected. And uh, it has happened with, uh, you remember, with Caligula, it has happened with uh, Claudius, but uh, these, uh, these were soldiers based in Rome. But now the soldiers of the legions scattered in the provinces come to play, come into play. And uh, you remember also that there was no constitutional rule uh, regulating succession. And therefore the field was open to the initiatives of uh, anybody who wanted to, uh, to, to come into the scene. And uh, we come to a year which is very peculiar, very strange, and uh, has come to be known as the uh, year of the four emperors. And uh, here in this map you can see the four emperors are Galba, Otto, Vitellius and Vespasianus, and, uh, or Vespasian, as we call it in, in English. And uh, you see that uh, these are, this is the map uh, of the uh, provinces which uh, um, backed every one of them. So, uh, apart from the, the, the pink, uh, the pink um, regions, which, are, which were not, uh, I would say, uh, ruled by any of these uh, emperors, which not, did not back any of these emperors, you see that uh, uh, on, on the left we have Hispania Taraconensis, and that's the land of Galba. Then we have uh, Lusitania, that's uh, Portugal, that's the land of Otto, uh, with the land of, for we, in which Otto was governor and which uh, backed Otto. Uh, the, the, the brown one on the, in the north, in France and Britannia, is the land which backed uh, Vitellius. And uh, uh, Egyptus, Syria, Judea, uh, Pal Palestine, uh, and Dalmatia and Moesia are the regions which backed the uh, emperor, uh, which backed the uh, Spasian. Uh, we will see why these regions backed these uh, characters. And uh, so the year following Nero's death is uh, 69, and uh, it is the most explicit demonstration of uh, this uh, fact of the role of the army. And uh, because four emperors succeeded each other, each proclaimed by their respective legions. And uh, so the, the old Galba was supported by the legions of the West and by the senators, because he was a senator, has been here, and uh, so uh, they saw him, they saw him as, as a colleague. And uh, so Galba was a uh, uh, proclaimed emperor, and, uh, but uh, he did not take advantage of this because uh, he started <laughs> in the wrong, the wrong way. He demanded that Nero's gifts were returned, be returned to mark the difference with, uh, with Nero, with uh, his predecessor. And also he wanted to restore uh, order and discipline, so he imposed uh, punishments and transfers. And even worse, of course, uh, for him, he refused to give the troops the gifts that their commanders had promised for their support at the swearing in of uh, Galba. And uh, he boasted that uh, the soldiers, he used to enlist them, not buy them. And uh, discontent uh, spread uh, among uh, all the legions, wherever they were. And uh, in fact, on January refused to renew their oath to him, uh, to Galba, as emperor. And uh, they sent a delegation to Rome, to the Praetorians, to inform them, <laughs> say, to inform them that the emperor created in Spain was not to their liking. And uh, they should elect one in Rome, the Praetorians and the senators should elect one whom all armies could appreciate. And uh, they didn't wait too much. A few days later, they proclaimed themselves their emperor. And it, it's uh, this man, Aulus Vitellius, the governor of Lower Germany. And uh, meanwhile, in, in Rome, in a solemn ceremony, Galba was associated to the throne, had associated to the throne uh, a nobleman, 
Lucius, uh, Lucius Calpurius Biso, who was well known in the Senate but was unknown to the soldiers. And uh, at this point, a third governor, this time of Lusitania, you remember Lusitania, it's uh, Marcus Salvius Otto. And Otto has, uh, we have met him before. He's uh, Popea's first husband who went to, who was sent to, to Lusitania by, by Nero and who wanted to marry Popea. And um, so Otho has supported Galba, but, uh, and he hoped also to, to succeed him. But uh, now he was disappointed because Galba had chosen a different heir, um, you remember, uh, Piso. And uh, so what did he do? He went to the barracks of the Praetorians and the Praetorians proclaimed him emperor. So in Rome, for a few hours, we have two emperors. Galba in the imperial palace and Otto in the Praetorian camp. And also there's a third one, uh, Vitellius in Germany. But uh, it didn't last long. Uh, a few hours later in the, in the forum, Galba was massacred by the Praetorians. And uh, so we come down to two, two emperors, Otto in Rome, supported by Praetorians, by Italy and the provinces of the East, and Vitellius in Germany, supported by the Western provinces. And uh, so Vitellius troops head for uh, Italy, and four months uh, there's a clash between the two armies, and uh, the um, Vitellius army defeats uh, Otho's troops near Cremona. So Otho suicided, and uh, it was all over, you say, yes? And we have, uh, out of three emperors, we have one. So, in, uh, it's all over. No, no, because even Vitellius, uh, Vitellius was painted by the sources as uh, cruel, gluttonous, and corrupt. Uh, they, they told about, uh, there were tales about uh, huge banquets, and uh, he was very, very, um, you can see also from his picture, from, from, from this uh, uh, statue, from this uh, bust. And uh, he only remained uh, emperor for a few months. Uh, the legions engaged in Palestine. Remember? Palestine. Yeah, it's, um, you know where Palestine is, Israel now. And um, these, the legions engaged in, uh, the, um, in Palestine, in Judea, as they call it, uh, for, to suppress the, the revolt of the Jews proclaimed them emperor, uh, their, their commander, Titus Flavius Vespasianus, uh, as, as their emperor. And it was the fourth emperor in one year, and luckily it would be the last. Vespasian's true legions joined with troops from Pannonia. You see, Pannonia uh, is uh, the region uh, which now is uh, Hungary. And, uh, and so, um, they headed uh, for Italy and they clashed with uh, the ones sent by Vitalio once again near Cremona. And uh, they defeated him in uh, December uh, 1469. So Vespasian's troops entered Rome and uh, hunted down Vitellius and his supporters. Uh, Tacitus recounts that uh, people were packing the windows and the roofs to watch that uh, massacre, cheering for the for the contenders, and uh, as if it was a game. And uh, Vitellius was con captured in his hiding place, and uh, we see a, 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 a picture which uh, gives you a, 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 an image, a, a clue about what what was happening. And uh, he was dragged naked around the city with a lace around his neck. He was targeted with the uh, excrements, tortured, and eventually he was thrown into the river Tiber. This city, Rome, which enjoyed uh, fratricide, these rebel armies, these emperors, to whom the people threw dung a few days after covering them in Hosannas. This is the capital of the empire in uh, 69 AD. Finally, we have an emperor. The emperor, the empire has an emperor. 
and uh, but he's not the one everyone expected and uh, but uh, I may say that uh, <laughs> luckily he, he was uh, he was the winner uh, you, you'll understand at the end of this tale why and uh, after Nero's uh, exhibitionism uh, fantasies excesses follies and Nero's tragedy is uh, his successor Vespasian is more normal as a man, but uh, no less interesting or, or no less uh, exciting. But uh, let me take a, a step back uh, and uh, let's go to, uh, to, the, to how Vespasian was born, to where Vespasian was born and how he became the general of the uh, Roman army in, uh, in uh, Judea. Vespasian was born near Rieti. Rieti is uh, 9 AD, is a, a town close to, close to Rome. And uh, at that time, Rieti was an important center of the Sabina. Sabina is the region um, south of Rome. And, uh, and uh, the, the Rieti had obtained the Roman citizenship uh, a long time ago. And uh, in the 3rd century BC, so it was already uh the, the citizens of Rieti of Rieti were already Roman citizens uh, had been already Roman citizens for uh 300 years and uh, this town was also the typical expression of uh, municipal Italy uh, and uh, its economy was predominantly agricultural but with some trading and uh, craftsmanship and Vespasian had embraced a uh, uh, military career which had led him everywhere, and he had earned ranks and salary on the field with uh, a thousand sacrifices. And uh, under Claudius, Vespasian had been the commander on the Rhine and on, uh, in Britain, and uh, here he had reported many victories that had earned him important uh, uh, honors. And then he had been proconsul in Africa, and he had earned a reputation as an experienced and brave general and uh, an integer man. In the end, Nero had chosen him to command the Roman troops in Judea, a very hot region uh, in those times and not only in those times. And uh, he had chosen him not only for his skills uh, as general, but also because uh, probably he did not seem to pose a danger, possible danger, for the humility of uh, his name and of his uh, origins. And uh, here in uh, Judea, Vespasian had fought uh, bravely, although uh, at the last phase of the campaign would be completed by his son Titus after he became, uh, after Vespasian became emperor. And we'll talk about it in the next, uh, in the next episode, uh, in two weeks. And uh, well, Vespasian has been defined as uh, the first, first uh, bourgeois hmm, emperor. Of course, this uh, adjective must be taken very carefully. And because in Rome, and more generally in the ancient world, there was no capitalism and there was no bourgeoisie, like those of the Middle Ages and even those uh, of the modern ages. And uh, he was uh, a bourgeois, let me say in, uh, in quotation marks, uh, because his grandfather, Titus, uh, Titus Flavius Petronis, uh, who had been a, a centurion, had returned to his uh, hometown in Rieti after military service and had become a tax collector. And um, uh, a tax collector, a, a publican uh, of the so-called Quattragesima Asie, the 2.5% tax on goods uh, passing through the borders of Asia. In this way, the family had become somewhat wealthy and uh, Vespasian's uncle had also managed to enter the Senate, so he had become a senator. And um, let me say, modern historians uh, say that uh, uh, to, 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 to explain the, uh, the very essence of, uh, of Vespasian, that uh, of Vespasian family that uh, they were, uh, let's say, money handlers, okay? And, uh, but you also have to keep in mind, please keep in mind always that uh, uh, for the, uh, in the dominant 
a system of values in the, in the scheme of uh, senatorial morality, so senators, and those who handled money were considered despicable individuals. The activity was unworthy of a gentleman, a gentleman dedicated to agriculture, a bit like England in the 70, in 718th and 19th century. And um, so when Vespasian uh, ascended to the throne, very cleverly, <laughs> very cleverly, he filled a gap uh, because he uh, had uh, a Senate decree define his legal position and powers. Uh, they had been defined with Augustus, but uh, uh, then uh, it, it has he had been more like uh, uh, uses, uh, like uh, something which, uh, which had been taken for granted, but there was not a law uh, granting in, in, uh, infinite, uh, un unlimited power to, uh, to the emperor. And uh, Vespasian used a, a very single, um, a very simple uh, formula, the Lex, uh, the Lex de Imperio Vespasiani. Uh, that's uh, the, the uh, law uh, about the uh, Vespasian's powers. Uh, it, it gave him very wide, practically absolute powers. And um, he could do whatever he deems, uh, I quote, whatever he deems useful for the superior interests of the state, not being bound by laws and plebiscites. In the same way as uh, Octavian Augustus uh, did same level of, of power, um, absolute, unlimited power. So Vespasian's government activity is twofold. On the one hand, the military, and the other, on the other hand, the money handling, as we said earlier, the administrator. And uh, of all the Roman uh, emperors, Vespasian was undoubtedly the most excellent administrator. And uh, when he ascended the throne, he found the empire's finances literally zeroed due to Nero's love for uh, luxury, he had no limits, and also to the expenses that Nero had faced to rebuild Rome after the terrible fire that had uh, devastated it, and also to, uh, for the consequences of the civil war of, uh, of the year uh, 69. And uh, I would say uh, his contemporaries and also the authors of later times uh, recall that uh, Vespasian was uh, a very frugal person and transferred this frugality to the imperial administration. He loved to flaunt his uh, parsimony and he was also a very witty man. Uh, a couple of anecdotes. <laughs> He had asked how much his funeral would cost, and someone had replied, a few million sesterzi. And uh, then uh, he had uh, replied, give me 100,000 100, now, and when I die, throw me into the river. <laughs> he had concluded. And another anecdote, uh, a young man whom he had appointed, uh, he had appointed a prefect had shown up to thank him, and uh, Vespasian had felt uh, a terrible, for him, <laughs> smell of refined and uh, expensive scents. And he has said, I would have preferred you to smell like onion. And uh, he had sent him away. Measures was the adoption on a, of a tax on uh, urinals. There were urinals were placed in on street corners uh, for passerby, and um, lavenders collected urine to extract uh, ammonia, by which they bleached uh, clothes in their workshops. And Vespasian established a tax for those who used them and a fine for those who did not use them. And uh, from this episode comes the expression "pecunia non olet." Money, money does not stink, to which in, in Italy, here in Italy, maybe, I don't know, maybe somewhere else uh, in, in other countries, 
but here in Italy it indicates that uh, money is always welcome from whatever source. And uh, Suetonius tells us that uh, uh, Vespasian's uh, son, Titus, uh, crit criticized his father for this law. And uh, Vespasian put a Sestertius under his nose and asked him ironically, does it smell? Well, Vespasian dedicated much attention to provinces. Uh, he favored the decision of the Roman citizenship, um, financed works in various cities affected by earthquakes and, and uh, fires. And uh, he granted uh, uh, numerous provincial cities the legal status of Roman colony, which made the inhabitants, you remember, Roman citizens. And uh, he brought into the senatorial order Italians and also provincials. And uh, with these initiatives, uh, equalization between Italy and the provinces got stronger and stronger. And it was uh, this was to make the structure of the empire even stronger. And uh, one of the cities where the link between the province and the uh, emperor is more evident is uh, Brescia, a town halfway between Milan and Verona, which also happens to be my hometown. And uh, this is a picture I shot uh, uh, a few uh, days ago in front of uh, the uh, Capitolium, and that's the temple, the Roman temple of the city. And in fact, my city boasts one of the most representative Roman temples of the entire Romanity, dating back to um, 1st century AD, namely to 73 DC, the third year of uh, Vespasian um, reign. And in fact, you see on, uh, on the top of the columns, you can see uh, the name uh, uh, Vespasianus Augustus, and, uh, in fact, it was erected in 73 uh, AD. And, uh, but uh, the memory of this uh, temple had been lost for a long time because uh, the temple, you can see a, a drawing here, was, uh, was almost entirely uh, covered by dirt and mud until the beginning of the 19th century. And only a white stone column uh, emerged in the garden of, uh, of, the, of the palace. And it, it, it's so strange, but uh, it, it actually happened. Everybody, uh, nobody remembered anything uh, about this, uh, this uh, temple. And uh, there were no drawings, no, no, no. It had been submerged uh, hundreds of years before. And uh, uh, Nobody, nobody remembered anything about it. And uh, finally, in uh, 1822, an excavation campaign was launched, which aim was to recover some Roman remains. Simply, they thought there were some Roman remains that it was. A, uh, they thought it could be a, a small uh, excavation campaign, and uh, they, they, they could find some a few Roman remains under the, the ground. And the surprise was great when the remains of the ancient temple and numerous findings that belonged to the cult building or the times that followed after its abandonment uh, came gradually to light. And it's huge because uh, you see my picture of me uh, on, the, on, the, on the steps of the, of the stairs uh, which lead uh, to the temple, and it, it was really it was really huge. And uh, the temple in which uh, in, in this temple, <coughs> sorry, in this temple, the Capitoline Triad was uh, venerated: Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva. And uh, so we can see that uh, Brescia was uh, uh, an integral part of the empire and had embraced the culture of Rome. And uh, it's a unique case in the panorama of northern Italy, not only for its uh, exceptional degree of conservation. The temple was also the, probably the seat for the worship of, uh, of the emperor. And uh, you see on the back there, there's, uh, you, can, you cannot see here, but you can see here, there's, uh, uh, there's a hill 
uh, it's called the Chidneo Hill, and that's where the mud and dirt uh, came, landslide. And uh, so uh, it was built in an area, in a sacred area, at least uh, on, on remains uh, on 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 a temple on on the temple which uh, was uh, um, built in during the Republican age in the second century BC. And uh, uh, I, I would say that uh, the temple is situated on a podium. You see the podium, uh, three meters high, with uh, uh, it's remarkably similar to uh, temples in uh, in Rome of the same age, and uh, it uh, consists of uh, three cells uh, and uh, with walls covered in marble, and uh, there was also a, a large altar in front of uh, of, uh, of of it, and uh, uh, it was flanked by two uh, monumental fountains, which enriched the imposing. Sonography. And uh, archaeological investigations conducted uh, close to the building have uh, highlighted the sequence of, uh, of uh, buildings, uh, cult buildings, uh, from the second century BC, when the city was still the capital of uh, the Galli Cenomeni, the Gauls Cenomenes. Uh, and uh, these Gauls uh, had been allies with Rome and had uh, strong uh, commercial and diplomatic uh, relations. With, uh, uh, with Rome. On the back of it, there's uh, a piazza, and I made this picture to show you what uh, um, the, the piazza of the, of the Forum. This is the Forum of, uh, of Brescia, and uh, you, 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 you can't see anything right now, but uh, I will show you something that uh, will give you an idea of uh, uh, what was there at the times of the Emperor. Uh, of the Emperor uh, Vespasian. Please follow this video and uh, I'll get back to you in, uh, in uh, a short time. You see this, uh, uh, this is the temple, so we are approaching the temple from the same direction um, where I, I came from. And um, this is a, a 3D simulation. We are going up and uh, we are approaching the temple, and um, now you will see uh, where what what uh, the what was like walking on the on the square of the Forum in uh, in uh, 73 BC DC uh, AD. You are now entering the Forum, the the the, the, the square. And uh, you see that uh, this is just uh, amazing. There were columns, uh, a colonnade flanking the piazza and uh, with the columns of marble. And now you are ascending the, 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 the stairs and going to the, uh, to the temple. If you remember, see the altar in front of, of the stairs of the temple. And if you remember, and later on you will be able to see uh, uh, um, a superimposing of uh, ancient elements or, or new elements. And this is the Basilica, which is not a religious uh, uh, building, but it's a, a civil building in, in Rome. Now you're entering the piazza, there's the square, the, the forum, and this is what, uh, what remains here uh, of the temple, but uh, look at it, you can see how it was, uh, it was uh, how it was. And uh, this is very realistic, and uh, that's why I liked it. Uh, I, I wanted to put it here. Uh, it gives you a, a, a very good idea of what was the, the architecture and the, the, of, of the place. All covered in marble, of course. And uh, on the back, you see the uh, College of Neo. And in front of, it, uh, of the temple, there's uh, the, um, the, the, the road, which is called the Decumanus, which is uh, the, the rain road passes in front of the temple. Okay. So the building is uh, precious evidence of Vespasian's 
building activity, which uh, little remains in Rome. And, uh, and as I told you before, it still reports the name of the emperor in, on the top of it, dating back to 73 AD. And it is probably the result of a donation from the emperor himself, a sign of his uh, benevolence after the battle of Cremona in 69, in which Brescia had, been, had remained faithful to, faithful to it. And, uh, but uh, an even more extraordinary find was waiting for archaeologists to, to uncover it. And in July 1826, a completely unexpected a deposit of large bronzes was uh, discovered between two walls of the temple. There was a, a fantastic bronze statue featuring a winged Victoria. And uh, together with it, six heads portrayed in gilded bronze. Fragments of statues, decorated frames, and that were to cover the architecture of the temple, the creation of uh, equestrian statues, and other various elements. And uh, the great bronze statue is one of the most important works of Romanity in composition, in material, and uh, only uh, one of the few Roman bronzes that uh, have come to us almost intact. You remember, we had uh, the bronzes of Riace, but uh, the, the, Riace, the bronzes of Riace uh, are, were made uh, in, in Greece and they, they date back to 4th or 5th uh, uh, century BC. This dates to 1st century AD and was made uh, probably in northern Italy. And uh, there's a female figure. Uh, this, this is the winged, the winged Victoria and uh, the, the, it's reproduced in bronze. It's almost two meters tall, 194 centimeters, with a posture that today is, uh, is incomplete. For uh, there, there are two elements that, uh, that miss and that uh, completed its gesture and balance. Uh, well, three elements. Uh, the left foot uh, had to rest most likely on the helmet of Mars. Uh, and uh, the left arm was, uh, had to support a shield, probably resting on the flexed leg, on which the deity engraved with a stylus, the third missing element, the name of the winner, um, offering it to the public. And uh, the figure is covered by, uh, with a cloak, which is uh, reproduced with, uh, as you can see, with great care and a realistic effect. And uh, the statue was uh, produced uh, probably in the second quarter of the first century AD and by a, a high-level bronze uh, workshop in northern Italy. So it was produced uh, locally and it was composed of numerous parts, melted separately and then welded to be a model uh, of significant and uh, naturalistic, I would say, effect. And... Uh, the preciousness of the material and the artistic quality suggests an uh, original location in, of this work in public spaces, such as the Forum, the Basilica, the theater, or the temple. And um, probably the, 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 these bronzes were hidden in, in a time of crisis to avoid uh, melting and reuse, perhaps between the 4th and 5th uh, century AD. And uh, here we come to, a, a, to, a, to a, a, something that uh, I, I want to tell you just to help you understand uh, more about, uh, about Italy and about uh, uh, antiquity. Um, so, bronze casting is a wonderful exercise in skill, and, uh, but also it's a, it's a very high symbol. And bronze in, the, in these ages uh, is... Uh, was referred to as the, the material that symbolized uh, eternity. In fact, the, uh, according to ancient points, the bronze monument is the one that can defy, defy time. And uh, every time we models find uh, uh, accidentally a bronze statue of antiquity, this generates an, in, an instinctive and uh, extraordinary emotion. Think of the bronzes of Riace, 
And when they were exposed, uh, tremendous popular enthusiasm rose around them in Italy, and not only in Italy, around the world, as if uh, everyone, uh, we felt the return of the ancient world. And so this happened, the same thing happened in 1826, when the winged victory emerged from uh, uh, centuries of oblivion. And uh, uh, let me say this, uh, this, is, this is quite peculiar. Almost all the bronze statues of antiquity are gone because uh, the bronze uh, was recast and subsequently reused, especially for weapons. And uh, so only recently we have understood that uh, um, in ancient times, in Greece and Rome, <coughs> bronze statues were very common even more, more than marble statues, but very few remain and the techniques uh, were, were lost. And uh, so the, the ability to, to produce masterpieces like this was, uh, was lost for, for many centuries. And it was only in the 15th century, 1400s, that uh, the great Florentine shops recovered that uh, techniques. This is the new home, the home inside the, the Capitolium of uh, uh, Victoria, of the Winged Victory, Victoria. And um, if it were not for the pandemic, the return of the statue to the city would have been celebrated with, as a new discovery with the widespread, widespread enthusiasm. And here we can see a, a sample of uh, how the statue was before restoration and how it is now. It has been restored by the Opificio uh, delle Pietre Dure of Florence and uh, in association, <laughs> let's think, think about this thing, in association with the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering of University di La Sapienza in Rome. Because restoring a, a statue like this uh, is, takes a, a lot of technique, a lot of, no, of knowledge, a lot of, a lot of skill and uh, so, but the, the result today is, is just uh, marvelous, okay? And it's even more marvelous live, seeing it live, in front, standing in front of it, as I did uh, uh, a few days ago. And uh, so we can go back to, let's go back to Vespasian. And Vespasian, um, about Vespasian, Suetonius writes also that uh, from the beginning of, uh, uh, to the end of his principality, he was... Uh, very simple as a, as a citizen and also very clever. And he never mm, hid the modesty of his origins. Mm, on the other hand, he, he boasted about it. And uh, Tacitus, the historian, also writes about a vast social transformation of the Roman world and uh, under Vespasian's rule. New men from the municipalities, from the colonies, were admitted uh, among the senators and uh, Vespasian himself in 73 reviewed the list of senators and uh, equites and, uh, and uh, uh, expelled some of them from, uh, from the Senate. And um, the, places were, the place was taken by new men coming from Italy and coming from the provinces. And it was a very powerful social change because this man brought new values, different values, they were very dynamic, very eager to assert themselves. And uh, also his family, his lifestyle, Vespasian's lifestyle also had uh, considerable consequences for the way of life of the ruling classes. And Tacitus says that, that uh, luxury, which for 100 years had been maintained with uh, unbridled expenses, gradually went out of fashion. Only five years before, Luxury was uh, very fashionable with uh, with Nero and uh, his uh, entourage, and now it's out of fashion. And uh, Tacitus said, "The one who more than any other established the severity of the costume was Vespasian, he himself an old-fashioned man, and from that moment, respect for the emperor and the desire to imitate him were more effective." Then the punishments threatened by laws and fear. Okay, so in short, uh, Vespasian, a moralizing Vespasian, 
reminiscent in many ways of the age of Augustus. <clears throat> At this point, it might seem strange that uh, an emperor as Vespasian was also the emperor Vespasian, was also the one who decided to start the construction of a huge amphitheater in the center of the Urbs, the Colosseum. You remember the Colosseum because uh, it is huge, but also because there was a statue of uh, the Colossus of Nero beside the, uh, the, the amphitheater itself. And um, it was a monument built mainly with the spoils of war of the, of the Jewish war. And uh, so it's, it's strange, okay? But it's only apparently uh, con contradictory, let me say, because you may see, uh, uh, you may think about the waste, a gigantic monument dedicated to, to shows, but uh, we can say the same thing as uh, we, with, uh, with uh, the stadiums that we have in our cities. And, uh, but the amphitheater was instead considered a fundamental element of Roman civic life. The amphitheater was uh, an authentic city institution. It was right in the center of the city. And without amphitheaters, there was no city. The people had no identity. And the dialogue between the prince and its uh, plebs, and his plebs, would not occur. And um, also in choosing the place where to build it, there was also a message of uh, moderation. The building rose on the site of the artificial lake, you remember, uh, in the spacious gardens of uh, Nero's Domus Area. There was a, a pool, a huge pool, and uh, they, they, they filled it up and uh, in, uh, in this space they built uh, uh, the, 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 the Colosseum. And uh, with this, uh, uh, in this way, Vespasian meant to give those spaces back to the people and uh, make them a public place and uh, uh, with a splendid public building. And uh, with the return of the site privatized by Nero to Roman citizens, to the public, to the state, the new Flavian dynasty intended to emphasize the difference between the old order and the new principality. The construction of the Colosseum start began under Vespasian in 70 AD. It was uh, inaugurated during Titus in uh, reign in 80 and concluded by Domitian in uh, the following years. But we'll talk about it tonight because obviously the project and the most of, of uh, its building, uh, its construction was, uh, uh, was due to, was under uh, the Emperor Vespasian in, uh, in the times of the Emperor Vespasian. The elliptical amphitheater measured 188 meters by 156 meters and the height of almost 50 meters. It could hold 50 to 75 spectators. And for its construction, 100,000 tons of uh, travertine, it's a uh, porous stone widely spread in Rome, were used and uh, as well as 300 tons of iron for the hooks that tie the blocks together. I've included, uh, once again, a small video to uh, let you understand uh, uh, how it was. Uh, take a look.
Okay, so let's get back to uh, the, the picture of, uh, of the Colosseum. Um, the external facade was, uh, consists of uh, four floors with uh, 80 arches on pillars for each uh, of the three lower floors. And um, the shelves uh, that you can see protruding from uh, the at about two thirds of the height of the fourth order were the base for the wooden antennas. You see the wooden antennas here, whose function was to um, support the velarium. The velarium was a large cloth cover that could be quickly deployed if necessary by a group, a particular group of sailors of the Roman fleet to protect the spectators from sun and rain. And uh, 80 arched entrances allowed the spectators to access the, am the amphitheater. And of these, four were reserved for magistrates, vestals, the priestesses of Vesta, and guests of honor, one for the emperor and four others of service for the wagons to reach the dungeons. The arches on the ground floor were numbered progressively, right, like as we do it today and the numbers corresponded to those marked on the spectators' tiles. The tiles, spectators has, had tiles to, to know how, where to enter. And uh, so the vast cavea inside was divided horizontally into three sectors. And uh, uh, above uh, a last gallery, a wide hallway with a balcony offered only standing places. And uh, a marble gallery was uh, reserved for high dignitaries. And uh, in the middle stood the suggestum, suggestum or the, the imperial lodge with the, all its uh, accessors. And the emperor sat on an ivory throne, throne as um, you can see, you saw in the, in, the, in the video. And in the back, tables were prepared for snacks and between numbers. So people drank and ate in, uh, in the amphitheater. And uh, each sector was reserved uh, to a particular category of citizens or in order of importance. But uh, uh, all in all, admission was free for everybody. And the two entrances along the main axis gave direct access to the arena. And the lowest the arena is the lowest space formed by a wooden table uh, sprinkled with sand. And in Latin, arena is, uh, is the, means uh, precisely sand. And uh, here the shows, uh, the shows took place. And uh, it was uh, 76 meters by 46 meters. And below the arena, there was a complex system of dungeons built perhaps uh, under Domitian when uh, naval battles uh, had been held uh, during uh, uh, Titus' reign, but uh, then Domitian, uh, naval battles were no longer staged under Domitian uh, a few years after the inauguration of the, of the Colosseum. And these dungeons were used for the services and the equipment of the show, and especially in the case of the great hunts, scenic elements, representing hills, groves, small lakes were used and uh, in the ingenious solutions had been, uh, had been adopted to create environments with uh, mechanisms that could bring uh, tools, uh, men and animals at the arena level at the right time. And uh, they used uh, elevators and uh, animals were pushed from their shelters through the corridors to cages, and the mechanism operated by one or more maneuvers elevated each cage to a higher level. And here the cage opened and uh, the animals went out uh, on a walkway connected to a ramp that led uh, to uh, a trapdoor corresponding uh, to the, uh, the arena's floor. And uh, the trapdoor then was lifted and the animal went outside ready for the show. So Tacitus recalls that uh, on one occasion, 100 lions were simultaneously pushed 
pushed into the arena, making the loud crowd mute with fear with their simultaneous roar. And uh, as for, for gladiators, they could access the arena directly from the main barracks, which stood next to the Colosseum via an underpass. Now, can you imagine on the days of the shows, this dark labyrinth, dozens of dozens of people, gladiators, guards, janitors, workers, and in the background, handling animals, moving around and uh, preparing for the death show, a real inferno cycle. Well, let's put ourselves in, the, in, in, Roman, in Roman clothes for, for a few minutes. And let's think that uh, we, are, uh, being, we have been allowed the day of the inauguration of the, of the Colosseum in, uh, in the year uh, 79 uh, under Titus. Uh, and uh, this is the first of 100 days of game to celebrate its uh, inauguration. And in these 100 games, uh, game days, 5,000 beasts will be open. And uh, uh, you access the, 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 the Colosseum and uh, and then you 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 stay in awe for for the whole day because uh, Romans uh, open, uh, were 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 in wonder they had wordless speechless about what was going on inside the Colosseum. The arena could be lowered and flooded like a lake basin, and reemerged as uh, uh, then it reemerged as a, a piece of desert and, uh, and jungle. And the first show, you, if you attended the show, you would see first the a presentation of uh, exotic animals, many of which you had never seen before and nobody had never seen before in Rome. 10,000 beasts, among them elephants, tigers, lions, leopards, panthers, bears, wolves, crocodiles, hippos, giraffes, lynxes, you name it. And many, you will have seen many of them uh, made up as characters from history or legend. And then the arena was uh, pulled uh, down and came up again with uh, a set for animal combat. So you would have seen lions versus tigers, tigers versus bears, leopards versus wolves. And then again, the arena would be pulled down and, uh, and come up as a Plaza de Toros, a Corrida. Bullfighting was uh, always already practiced by the Etruscans and had been imported to Rome by Caesar, who liked it very much when he had seen it in, in, uh, in Spain. And the Romans had immediately became, become uh, very passionate about this. Uh, about the, the Corrida, the, bull, the, the fight with bull, and they loved it. And uh, in the arena, some didn't even fight. They should represent some characters in mythology and suffer a tragic, their tragic end. They were condemned to the damnatio et bestias. That's my mauling reserved to the enemy of the state, including prisoners and slaves uh, who were, had been found guilty of a serious crime. They were sent uh, to die naked with little chance of defending themselves against beasts. And uh, even if they managed to take them, some of them, uh, other animals uh, would be introduced into the arena until the condemned were all dead. And according to the mentality of, uh, of the time, these shows were edifying for the young people. And as such, uh, they were not uh, forbidden to minors at all. And finally, you would have seen the arena, uh, the preparation of the arena for the most 
uh, for the show you uh, you looked forward to. You had been looking forward to uh, to it for the whole day, and uh, it was the fight of the gladiators. Almost all gladiators had been sentenced to death for murder, robbery, blasphemy, mutiny, the crimes for which death were inflicted. And however, there were also some volunteers, not all of them of low extraction, who enrolled as gladiators in, uh, uh, in, uh, in gladiator schools and then fought in the circus. And these uh, uh, gladiators had a one in two chance of becoming popular heroes at each fight. And poets uh, dedicated them their verses, sculptors, their story, their statues, and ladies, their graces. And if they didn't win, they had an obligation to die with indifference. They were called by various names according to the weapons they used, and uh, each show included hundreds of duels, which could even end without, without a death. If the defeated had conducted well himself with courage and still, and uh, he would have been pardoned by the crowd with the gesture of the thumb raised. And uh, during uh, back to the age of Augustus, during an eight-day show offered by Augustus, ten thousand gladiators fought, and guardians dressed, uh, were dressed as uh, Charon and Mercury and they stung the fallen with the sharp of pitchforks to see if they were dead, and the simulators were beheaded, and slaves piled up the corpses and brought new sand for the next fights. Okay, and uh, the last video of tonight is a, a short uh, extract from uh, the movie Gladiator. It is, uh, the movie Gladiator is uh, uh, the, 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 the era, the times, is uh, uh, um, close to the end of the, um, the second century, so close to uh, during the reign of Emperor Commodus, you remember the, uh, the son of Marcus Aurelius, but uh, I think that uh, this short video gives you uh, a pretty real, uh, realistic idea of uh, what was going on. Okay. So, uh, pretty impressive, I would say, and pretty realistic. Anyway, you've seen the, the, the throne, marble throne of the emperor, you've seen the arena, you've seen the dungeons, you've seen the uh, gladiators uh, saying, uh, Caesar, uh, those who are about to die salute you, morituri ave Caesar, morituri te salutant, and... Uh, You've seen also a reproduction of the Battle of Zama between uh, Hannibal and Scipio, and uh, it's uh, it's uh, there are some elements which are not realistic uh, in, uh, in in the Gladiator, but uh, this uh, this uh, shot with this uh, few minutes are quite realistic and can tell you what would happen. What happened? Also, the crowd. You see the crowd. You see people eating and uh, laughing and cheering. And with people dying on the on the arena, and uh, you see people uh, being fans and uh, pushing uh, gladiators and uh, cheering about uh, uh, people being killed. And uh, but all in all, I would say that uh, this is a very good representation of what happened in the Colosseum. What what would happen in the Colosseum, inside the Colosseum, for hundreds of years. And uh, uh, strange, very strange to our mentality. Th this way of, uh, of having fun, of uh, blood, torture, it, it did not raise any objections, even among the strictest uh, moralists. And only Seneca said, left us a condemnation of gladiatorial games. And he wrote, uh, man, the most sacred thing in the world here is skilled for sport and fun. But uh, the fact is that uh, this shows where the very expression, the very representation of the moral level of Rome, which was not yet Christian, but uh, it was not even 
no longer even pagan. Uh, the emperor who presided over the games uh, was also the high priest of uh, a state religion and of a society who found nothing to object to such a disgrace for, for the simple reason that they did not believe in anything anymore. Uh, and Rome uh, uh, celebrated its festivities and uh, created new idols and raised new, new temples, but uh, faith had uh, disappeared. And uh, it was, faith was now in uh, uh, the only ones who had faith in Rome were the Christians. And they gathered instead of uh, inside the Colosseum, they gathered uh, underground to, to, to pray for, for the salvation of their soul. And also, before Christianity, we are here before Christianity, and Christianity will introduce concepts as pity and mercy in the Western world. But before Christianity, blood, cruelty, the right of the strongest to dispose of the weakest. As he wished. These were concepts uh, very, very familiar to those places and inherent in the, in the Roman mentality. And uh, Rome's dominion itself, dominance itself over other peoples war was based on strength and uh, overpowering. And the Romans who considered themselves uh, more civilized has, uh, had simply elevated uh, life and death fights to uh, institutional amusement and uh, um, use uh, and use the, the 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 best of their technology for these uh, amusements. So gladiators' fights were abolished uh, immediately after 438, um, about 40 years before the fall the fall of the empire. And, but the Colosseum had been uh, had been used uh, in those times for almost 400 years, and uh, the last known show uh, was uh, was a hunt, and it was held in uh, 523 under under the Gothic king uh, uh, Theodoric, and in the Middle Ages, uh, as Rome at, at one point was reduced to a city of just over. 20,000 inhabitants, you remember? It was a million inhabitants in, uh, in, in the, uh, at the times of the Emperor Trajan. One million inhabitants down to 20,000 inhabitants. And so the Colosseum turned uh, from an imposing monument to a quarry, a quarry and a stone deposit. And uh, because uh, it offered material already elaborate and ready to use. And uh, going back to our protagonist, and uh, it's, uh, it's time to, 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 it's the time of the end of, uh, of our tale of tonight. Um, a wise and prudent emperor like Vespasian, mindful, was mindful of the tragedies of the pageantry of power and in the age of the cloudy, remember? Nero, but also uh, Caligula, Claudius, and uh, he could not fail in preparing, in preparing his uh, succession. And in fact, uh, he set uh, a clear hereditary rule. He associated uh, his two sons, Titus and uh, Domitianus, uh, in the management of uh, the mission, in the management of the empire, and uh, the, the mission had the honorary office of consul several times, and uh, the older Titus was given the Praetorium, Prefecture, that is, it was head of uh, Praetorians. And then, uh, when, uh, so, when Vespasian died in, uh, suddenly, in 79, power passed uh, for the first time without shock to his son Titus. Well, it seemed that uh, the empire had finally found a way to protect itself from uh, authoritarian figures bordering on madness and uh, from the bloodshed that uh, had accompanied their death. You remember Caligula, Claudius, but also Nero. But uh, a few years later, 
Rome would relieve the nightmares of Caligula and Nero. Okay, that's uh, all for today. I've been online almost one and a half year, uh, hours, well, but uh, it's been a pleasure for me uh, entertaining you uh, with, uh, with this uh, story and I hope that uh, you, uh, are, you want your will to come to Italy and see these wonderful things uh, and live uh, once again uh, these uh, this, uh, uh, years of madness but also of uh, greatness uh, here with us uh, uh, your will is, uh, is increasing. And uh, I'll wait for you in, uh, in two weeks. Uh, and the next time we will talk about uh, Emperor Titus and uh, Domitian and also about uh, uh, the, um, the great event of uh, uh, 79 AD, the eruption of the Vesuvius uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, the end of the city of Pompeii. Thank you very much for your attention. So see you in two weeks uh, and uh, follow us uh, uh, in, uh, in our, uh, on our website in uh, you know all our addresses. So I look forward to meeting you in two weeks uh, again. Ciao, uh, have a nice weekend. Bye bye. Ciao, arrivederci.